Good morning, Uptown Church. I uh, hope you guys are doing well this morning. We're so glad to have you with us here on Facebook Live. Uh, another Sunday uh, with Uptown Church, and um, we'd love for you guys to greet each other during the um, announcements time. Um, say hi and, and encourage each other. If you're new, we'd love to hear um, hear from you, hear where you're tuning in from, and uh, say hi to each other. I'm going to open up with uh, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 through 31. Have you not, have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God and creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I just want to encourage you this morning as we go into the presence of the Lord through worship to once again turn your focus to the Lord as best as, it you, as, best as you can. Whatever distractions are in your room or in your space, I encourage you to um, make space for the Lord right now in this next hour. Focus on the strength of the Lord this morning. I know many of us may be weary. We may be growing weak. We may be growing faint. There may be pain and there are struggles and there is so much that can fill our hearts. But those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength and they will have the power to get through this day, get through this hour, get through this moment. So we just want to submit ourselves to the Lord this morning, and we want to ask for the strength of the Lord to fill us. Father, we are thankful, and we are grateful for your strength. We are thankful that, Lord, even though us in our human humanness and in our weakness, Lord, we grow faint, we grow weary, we go tired, our minds get exhausted, our emotions get drained, we feel so many things, Lord. And God, we submit those, those, those weaknesses to you, Lord, the weakness of needing you, Lord. Is that the weakness? I don't know, but I pray, Lord, that we would open our hearts to not help just ourselves, but to have you, Lord, do the work in us, have you do the strength that we need and get us through today and tomorrow and the days ahead. Lord, let your strength fill your people this morning in their rooms and where they're tuning in. May your spirit be felt. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you, and we give you all honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Hey, guys. Good morning. Let's just turn our eyes on Jesus. I wish I was looking at your actual faces instead of this little one-eyed camera, but. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just welcome you this morning. We invite your joy, Lord, into our houses this morning. Through 
the dark. Through the dark, I hear your voice. Rising up, I will rejoice. I was lost, but now I'm found. And even death can't hold you down. Cause you are God, you're the great I am. Breath of life, I breathe you in. Even in the fire. I will lie in you. You are strong in our brokenness, sovereign over every step. Even in the fire, I'm alive, I'm alive in you. Oh, I'm no longer I who live, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me, Christ who lives within me, from beginning to the end, you deserve the glory, you deserve the glory, we'll sing it again, it's no longer I who live. But Christ who lives within me, Christ who lives within me, from beginning to the end, you deserve the glory, you deserve the glory, cause you are God, you're the great I am, breath of life I breathe in, even in the fire, I'm alive in you, you are strong. Broken, sovereign over every step, even in the fire. I'm alive in you. You are God, great I am. Breath of life, I breathe you. Even in the fire, I'm alive in you. You are strong in our brokenness, sovereign over every step, even in the fire. I'm alive. I'm alive in you. Jesus, we're alive in you. We're alive in you. Nothing can separate, even if I ran away, cause your love never fails. I know I still make mistakes, but you have no mercy for me every day, cause your love never fails. You stay the same. Stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid because I know that you love me. Your love never fails. You never fail. The wind is strong. The wind is strong and the water's deep. I'm not alone here on these open seas. Cause your love never fails. The chasm is far too wide. I never thought I'd reach the other side. 
Cause your love never fails You stay the same You stay the same through the ages Your love never changes Mother, sing it out in your room And when the ocean is made, I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Your love never fails Sing your love never fails Your love never fails You make all things you make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good Jesus I pray that our faith would be strengthened this morning I pray that we would see how you're working things out and help us to surrender help us to surrender sing that again you are good you make all things you make all things work together for my good I believe that today you make all things work together for my good sing it one more time you make all things work together for my good you make all things work together for my good. You stay the same. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. Maybe pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rain. I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Your love never fails You never fail Your love never fails Let's sing you make all things one more time You together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. Because you love us. You make all things work together for my good. trusting in our strength, not trusting in governments, not trusting in the power of man, we're trusting you. We trust in your goodness, we trust in your sovereignty.
to the heaven Your faithfulness Stretches to the sky Like the mighty mountains, oh, your justice flows like the ocean star. Sing that again, your love, oh Lord. Your love, oh Lord, reaches to the heaven. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. And your justice flows like the ocean. Let's lift our voices And I will lift my voice To worship you, my King I will find my strength In the shadow of your wings Cause your Stretches to the sky. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Oh, we trust you. Your justice flows like the ocean side. I will lift my voice. I will lift my high voice to worship you, my King. I will find my high strength in the shadow of your wings. And I will lift my voice to worship you. Find my high strength in the shadow of your wings.
Good morning, church. Would you just join me in prayer this morning? Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we in this moment, we just admit our need for you. Lord, we need you. As we are continuing on through this year and through these times, Lord, we need you. Lord, and for those of us that have been trying so hard in our own strength, in our own power to just navigate everything, Lord, in this moment, would we just surrender to you and say that we need you. Lord, those who are weary, would you give them strength? Lord, those who are tired, would you fill them with the energy of your Holy Spirit? Lord, those that are battling despair and hopelessness, Lord, would you be their hope in this moment? Lord, whatever it is that people are deficient in, whatever we are deficient in, in this moment, would you come in? But you need us to surrender, Lord. You're not going to fight us. So may we invite you in. Bring healing, Lord. Bring restoration. Bring wholeness to the broken. Bring community to the lonely. Bring peace to the grieving. We offer ourselves to you, Lord. Amen. Thank you so much for being here with us today, David. Thank you for leading us in worship this morning and for the scripture, Kara, that you uh, shared with us. Uh, if this is your first time with us as a guest here at Uptown Church, we would love to uh, know who you are and say hello to you. So you could just maybe put your name, where you're uh, watching from, and maybe just indicate that you're new uh, and that you're watching, uh, participating for the first time. Our family, our Uptown Church family, would love to greet you and say hello to you. Uh, so go ahead and do that. For the rest of the church family, would you just say hi to each other? Would you just flood the uh, comment section with hellos, greetings, uh, just like buttons, heart emojis, just reach out and interact in some short, quick way with those that you know that are watching. And then for those that are here for the first time, I would love to be able to connect with you as the pastor. There is a link on the screen, and there's also that link is going to be in the comment section as well. And if you would, just follow that link right now. I know it's going to take you away from the service for just a few seconds, but just put your name and email address in, and that's going to allow me to be able to reach out to you and for our church to be able to keep you up to date with what's happening here so you can get to know us uh, a little bit more. So uh, right now, anyone that's new is following that link. Everyone else is saying hi to each other. They're using the like buttons, the emojis. They're greeting each other. Uh, feel free to do all of that. Um, I want to thank everybody that has participated so far in the church survey. Uh, you should have received, if you filled out the family directory, you should have received a text message. Uh, we're trying to, uh, uh, we're experimenting with a new form of communication with a link that allowed you to fill out the church survey. We've had a great response so far, but if you have not yet done it, by Labor Day, we're asking everyone to help us out by giving us feedback uh, so that we know uh, how to plan better for when we regather and also for how we can plan better in terms of offering meaningful ministry during this time of social distancing. So please fill out the church survey. Uh, also by Labor Day, we're asking everyone to turn in their church sing-along submissions. Uh, we are trying to put together a church project that brings all of our voices together in unison to sing a quick, short worship song. We are not looking for people with talent. We're looking for everybody and anybody to participate. I don't care how off-key you sing. Uh, I know myself and our family is going to be bringing our submission in. We are wanting the submissions by Labor Day. Uh, there is, uh, in the church email, 
uh, links to the video, to everything that you need. David has made it super simple uh, and easy for all of us to participate. It'll take a few minutes. You're not gonna probably get it right on the first try, but that's okay. Uh, just get the submission in, send it to David, upload the file to where he's asking you to upload it. And then in September, we're hoping to feature the church choir as we all come together to sing uh, a beautiful worship song to the Lord. We're continuing our prayer and fasting in August on Thursdays. Thank you for those of you that are joining in with us. We as a church are committing ourselves to taking Thursdays as a day to commit to the Lord, to pray and to seek him during these times. We conclude with the uh, church Bible study on, on Zoom. We're going through the book of Acts together and then we're taking an extended time to pray together uh, as well. Uh, giving, you can continue to give your uh, um, tithes and offerings and your donations to Uptown Church through our website. Uh, you'll see the link on the screen and in the comment section, uptowncov uh, slash giving. Uh, uptowncov.org slash giving. You can also text 84321. You can text a dollar amount to that number and then you can give that way as well. Uh, you are helping to fuel ministry and mission here at Uptown Church by your faithful giving uh, during these days. Uh, Virginia is putting together a care team, and she's looking for people that feel uh, uh, the, the calling to help provide care and benevolence ministry here within the Uptown Church body. Her email address is on the screen. Would you reach out to her if you are interested in being part of that care team? I know that she would love to talk with you uh, and help you uh, engage in that way. We want to help everyone engage in, in, in a way that's meaningful for ministry uh, here within the Uptown Church family. Uh, you're, if you were involved in the small groups, the Zoom small groups, you should have heard from your Zoom leader that by at the end of the month, at the end of August, we will be ending this season of small groups. We are not ending small groups altogether. We are just looking at how to revamp for the fall, and the church survey is actually going to be really important for us to hear from you so that we know how we need to better serve you, the church family, with our small group uh, offerings. So we are going to be relaunching our small groups this fall. Uh, community and connection are super important during these times, especially in more intimate settings. So um, just be on the lookout for details coming as we are hearing from you, your feedback in the church survey. I also want to put it on everybody's radar that this is a potential thing. There's nothing that's set in stone yet, but we are looking at possibly hosting an outdoor service on Labor Day weekend, September 6th. Uh, more details will be to come, that's in a few weeks, but the, the goal would be that people would be able to drive or walk in, uh, and then we would be hosting an outdoor service where we can all be together in a safe, socially distanced way. So just be on the lookout for that. We don't have all of the plans in place, but I wanted to get, put it on your radar so that you can uh, plan accordingly. We are still going to do our best to stream the service online so that those that feel comfortable attending in person uh, to an outdoor service can come, but those that feel that they need to stay uh, in, uh, indoors would be able to still participate as well. We um, are still hosting Uptown Kids Zoom meetings every Saturday at 10 a.m. So even though small group season is coming to an end, the kids Sunday school hour, which is basically what it is at 10 a.m. on Saturdays, is going to continue on. It's super important for us to continue to disciple uh, our kids uh, and to come alongside you parents in the job that you're doing to help reinforce the love of God uh, uh, and, and the word of God in the hearts of our children. So every Saturday at 10 a.m., that's still going to continue even though the adult Zoom uh, groups are winding down here at the end of August. We still would love for you to send in your videos and your uh, photos so that we can see you and we can hear from you during this time of online church. Uh, let's take a look at the screen. Ethan has sent in a quick hello for all of us. Hey Uptown Church, good to be doing service with you and hopefully connecting at post-service coffee. Uh, I'm also grateful for the small group interaction throughout the week. Uh, like Galatians 6 says, let's not get tired of doing good, but continue to show good to everybody and we'll see the results eventually. Great to hear from you, Ethan. Thank you for sending that in. Uh, would you, Uptown Church family, say hello to Ethan in the comments? Let him feel a warm welcome from you as you have heard his welcome 
uh, to you. I also have a couple of photos to share with you. The first photo is a picture sent in by Elizabeth uh, Lou and Brittany Cameron, uh, two of our newest moms in the church with their little ones, uh, Naomi and Miriam, and they ended up seeing each other here in the neighborhood. So would you say hello not only to Elizabeth and Brittany, but also say hello to the little uh, kids, to Miriam and Naomi as well. We are so blessed to have young babies being born into uh, the church family. The next uh, picture I have for you is our women's gathering. Virginia uh, put together a meet and greet by the beach in the park over by Margate. And this is a look at uh, all of the women that came to that, that were there. I've already heard really good things about how God moved and ministered and encouraged women uh, at this event. So Virginia, thank you so much for putting this together. Uh, thank you women of Uptown Church for attending and being a part uh, as well and hopefully we can see more things like this happening uh, in the near future. So say hello. If you see someone in that photo that you would like to say hello to, make sure you do that. And also thank Virginia for all of the work and effort uh, that she put into putting that together. Uh, I know that uh, alongside of her, Kara, Terry Ballard, Priska, and others who shared were instrumental in helping to make it all happen uh, as well. And hopefully I didn't miss anybody with that. We are continuing on into our bodybuilder series. Uh, we are exploring Ephesians chapter 4, where Paul outlines the fivefold ministry of the church, sharing the different roles and the functions uh, that are put in place to bring leadership and guidance to the body of Christ so that we can build up and edify the church. Uh, we are this week focusing on shepherd pastor, uh, and it is uh, our privilege to have Una Lucy Lee. Uh, joining us from Madison, Wisconsin to share this morning. Uh, before I fully introduce uh, Una, I want to share my test results, which I've been doing every single week. We have a website that we're offering everyone to participate in by going to fivefoldministry.com. Uh, by going to that website, you can take a 10-minute test that can sort of help guide you uh, a little bit into maybe understanding better uh, how you fit into one of the, or two of these roles and functions. Uh, this is not a uh, firm test. It's just something to help give us guidance, to help resonate with us so that we can maybe understand our own giftings and our own passions a little bit more uh, along these areas. My test, which is showing up there, has a pretty much an even tie between teacher apostle uh, as my dominant uh, uh, sense of role and function within the fivefold ministry. Uh, and we will be talking today about the one that I scored the least in, which is Shepherd Pastor. Uh, so uh, it'll be great for me to hear from Una uh, this morning. Uh, and it's uh, great to have the entire fivefold ministry at work within the body because we all need each other. Uh, none of us are superstars or superheroes where we embody everything completely, 100%. Uh, we all have strengths, we all have weaknesses, and we need each other in this thing called the church. Uh, Una and her husband Henry live in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, Una was here last summer uh, sharing with us. Uh, she is on staff at Fountain of Life Church there in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, a wonderful covenant church up there. It's so great to have her back. Uh, I wish she could be here in person, but she's not. Uh, but she is joining us from Madison via video. So would you join me in welcoming Una as she shares with us via the five-fold ministry outlined in uh, Ephesians 4 regarding shepherd and pastor. Hello, beautiful people of Uptown Church. Thank you for having me. Thank you to Pastor Jeremy for inviting me to teach. Um, I'm glad to participate in the series that you're doing on Ephesians 4. I'm coming at you from Madison, Wisconsin, where I live with my husband, Henry, and our dog, Kaylee. Another thing about me is that when I was young and I thought about what job I wanted when I was older, I wanted to be a newscaster. I just thought it'd be super cool to like behind a camera and talk and say the news. I didn't really have a vision for being a weather person. It was more the, the news. Um, I also thought I had a really cool name. I mean, can you hear it? I think it's great. Like evening news with Una Lucy. I just thought that would have been great. Well, here I am somewhat living my childhood dream of speaking into a camera, um, not, you know, speaking not to people who are hearing this at this point, 
Um, now the difference is there's no teleprompter. Nobody did my makeup. I did my own makeup. I got some notes. Got my Bible. I wish you could see the contraption. So I, no lie, to like get this thing all rigged together. We've got a wood box. We've got I've got a huge um, <clears throat> soup pot. About five large recipe books. I've got a computer stand. I mean, we really MacGyvered this thing over here. But I'm glad to be here. And I'm going to seek to channel my childhood dream of being a newscaster to bring this message to you this morning. As mentioned, I'm participating in the series that you're doing in Ephesians 4. And um, let me read to you the, that section of Ephesians 4. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. <clears throat> I love that these five functions are gifts from God. And they're gifts from God for the people of God. Pastor Jeremy asked me to teach on the function of the shepherd in the church. In the last few weeks, I've spent quite a bit of time reading through the Bible to understand how shepherding is described in the Bible. I've read some books and done some other things, but primarily I've been just reading a lot in the Bible. It's been really interesting and quite life-giving. There are two ways that shepherds are talked about in the Bible. One is actual shepherds. The earliest mention of it is in Genesis 4. Abel, who is one of Adam and Eve's son, is described as a shepherd. So one of the ways that shepherding is used in the Bible is actual shepherds. We know that King David was a shepherd. The other way that shepherding is used is metaphorically. Metaphorically for people who are leading other people, so leaders, and for how God is leading his people. References to God as shepherds begin in Genesis. Where when Jacob is blessing Joseph, he mentions how God has shepherded him his whole life. <clears throat> and then God as shepherd is highlighted in the prophets, mostly in this when the leaders are doing a bad job. And then God comes in as a shepherd to take care of the people. Probably the most famous use of the image of shepherd connected to God is in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I want nothing. When we get to the New Testament, Jesus picks up this image to describe himself, particularly in John 10, when he just calls himself he says, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd, says Jesus. <clears throat> and then finally, the image I love, the metaphor of God as shepherd that really, really just wells up a lot of hope in me is from Revelation chapter 7. And we can read there, starting in verse 16, never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. So throughout the Bible, there's great use of the image of shepherd, particularly related to God. So considering like what I learned about actual shepherds like Abel and David and leaders who were described as shepherds in the Bible and God as shepherd, I gleaned a few things about shepherds, and it's quite simple. It's very simple. Primarily, shepherds lead the flock of sheep away from home to get food, water, and to rest. And then once they get all the food and the water and the rest, then the shepherd brings the flock of sheep home. Now, if along the way throughout the day, predators threaten the flock, well, the shepherd's going to take care of the predator. Or if sheep, for some reason, go wandering away from the community, the shepherd will go and get the sheep. But the mission of the shepherd is pretty simple. It's actually four words. Four words describes what shepherds do. Keep the flock together. They keep the flock together. 
Likewise, in the church, shepherding is about keeping the community together. Shepherds in the church have a nourishing influence in the community. Shepherds in the church have a protective influence in the community. Shepherds in the church have a hospitable and a healing and a unifying influence in the community. Shepherds keep the flock together. Now, as I'm describing what shepherds do and what they're like in the church, I wonder if you're thinking about a few people at Uptown, people that you know, people who are nurturing, people who unify, people who are healing, perhaps protective. Why don't you take just a moment right now, right now as you're thinking about these people, write their name down. If you have a pen or paper, or if you're on your phone, you can put it in a notes app. It's possible that these people are shepherds and that they're in your community and they're there as a gift from God. When the number of the disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. At this time in the community in Jerusalem, it was, it's estimated that there were a couple thousand followers of Jesus. There had been rapid expansion in the church under the leadership of the 12 apostles. And we see from verse 1 that the community of believers is growing in those days when the number of disciples was increasing. So the, the group is growing, the community is growing, the church is growing. And then we see in verse 7 more growth. So the word of God spread, the number of disciples increased rapidly. There is growth in this church. There's growth in verse 1, there's growth in verse 7, and to me it begs the question, like, what happened between verses 1 and 7? Something happened, because it says in 7, so the word of God spread. Like, in result, in consequence, you know, there was a cause and effect. This thing happened to the effect that the word of God grew. What happened? Well, saints, there was a big old conflict. A conflict involving birthplace and gender, language, socioeconomic status. And in this community that was growing, we see in the conflict that a predator had emerged. A predator had emerged that was threatening to break the flock up. It was a conflict involving the predator of prejudice. It was a conflict involving unfair treatment <clears throat> of widows. And without the shepherds paying attention to what was going on and paying attention and noticing like, oh my gosh, there's a predator and this predator will destroy this community. Without their shepherding, 
the community wouldn't have stayed together and the mission would not have stayed intact. But what we're going to see in Acts 6 is how they did shepherd. And thus, the word of God spread. And the church grew rapidly because of what they did. <clears throat> but I want to back up just a little bit, if you don't mind. In Acts 4, we can read this, starting in verse 32. And listen to all, like, all the inclusive words. <clears throat> all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in all of them that there was no needy person among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, and they brought the money from the sales, and they put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Chapter 6, we've got a big old conflict, but just two chapters earlier, the community of believers is unified, they're sharing so much that nobody has any needs. And they're sharing so much that people are selling property and then bringing that money to the apostles to distribute. That is an incredibly beautiful picture of unity and the church taking care of one another. Yet two chapters later, we see some cracks. Where, there once were, where they once were unified as believers, there's now a discussion of groups within the groups, isn't there? There are the Hebrews and the Hellenists. In my research, I learned that there was a historical rift between the Hebraic Jews and the Hellenistic Jews. And the rift goes something like this. The Hellenist Jews, Jewish, you know, in practice and culture and everything, but they were born in Greek-speaking places. Born, lived, worked, raised families, the whole shebang. Their primary language is Greek. They were ensconced in Greek culture, even though they maintained, um, they maintained their love and commitment to Yahweh. Now, it was practice at that time that many Jewish people would retire in Jerusalem. It seemed like a great place to retire. So when they would retire, they would bring their Greek-speaking language and their cultural understanding and all the things that they had all their lives. They would bring that to Jerusalem. So that's the Hellenistic Jews. Jewish, but born other places, speak different languages, have different cultural assumptions. The Hebraic Jews, natives of Palestine, they spoke Aramaic, and they adhered to Hebrew culture. It's worth noting that the 12 apostles most likely identified as Hebraic Jews. So from the Hebraic Jewish perspective, the Hellenists weren't quite Jewish enough. I mean, the real Jews were born in Palestine, they spoke Aramaic, they lived the Hebraic way, and the Hellenistic Jews, they were almost Jewish except for they spoke a different language and they had different cultural assumptions and, and they weren't born in the right place. This historical rift was brought into this church in Jerusalem. Now this rift is akin to the experience many people of color have had where someone asks them, where are you from? Fairly. And then the person comes back and says, no, like, like, really, where are you from? No, I'm really from Sacramento, California. No, no, come on. Like, where were you born? So it begins as a fairly innocent, innocuous, perhaps curious question. Behind that ends up being a question about where were you born? And are you really from here? I mean, if you're, like, where are you from? If you're not from here, where are you from? I've had this experience before when people have asked me about Henry. So my husband is Asian American, and I've had people say, hey, well, where is he from? And I say, he's from Chicago. 
And they're like, no, really, where is he from? And then if I remember right, I try to say whatever neighborhood from Chicago that he's from. But they will persist, inferring, he's not really from here. He's not really American, right? I mean, is he American enough? I mean, fundamentally, these questions are about how American someone really is. And the inference is that real Americans, real patriots, are white, and they're born in the US, and they speak English only. I don't know if you believe me, but let me tell you another story. Someone I used to work with has Japanese and Korean roots. She has a Japanese sounding last name. She presents very Asian. Um, just the way she looks and lots of her features presents a very Asian. Her family has been in the United States for at least four generations. She gets asked all the time, where are you from? She's like, I'm from here. No, really, where are you from? In contrast, I'm a child of immigrants. My parents immigrated in their early 20s. They met in San Francisco. I've never been asked, where are you from? No one has ever questioned whether I'm really American. You understand what I'm saying? I hope this makes sense. So the assumptions about how Jewish someone really is, is playing as the white noise behind this community in Act 6. Here in Act 6, we see that folks brought prejudice and negative implicit bias about others into the church community. Yes, they were all followers of Jesus now, but historical fissures were starting to emerge in the community. <clears throat> the predator of prejudice had emerged, had infiltrated the flock, and the sheep were getting restless. The community was threatened. The flock was not together. Now, I want to clarify one thing. The enemy exposed in this community is not the cultural, linguistic, socioeconomic differences between the Hebraic Jews and Hellenistic Jews. Because if we peek back to Acts 2, we see that the Holy Spirit actually uses these differences to bring these people together. In Pentecost, like, wasn't the amazing thing of like, what are all these different languages? I'm hearing, you know, there were God-fearing people from all, every nation, it says in Acts 2. And when the Holy Spirit came, and the people started testifying about Jesus, it was in all these different languages. So the beginning of the church was based on differences. It grew on differences. The differences in the community were celebrated, should be celebrated. Again, back to Revelation, it describes in Revelation a parade where the kings of the nations will bring their best into the new Jerusalem, and the nation's best will all be very different. But the nation's best will be celebrated and it will be for the community forever in the New Jerusalem. So the enemy exposed in this community in Act 6 is discrimination based on difference, but it's not the difference that's the problem. One part of the community was being deprived and it is no coincidence that they were all the Hellenistic Jews, the Hellenistic widows. So differences of culture, you've got gender, you have age. You understand? You am I making sense? I hope so. I wish you were here so I could get like a rowdy amen or I could see the frowns on your face. But I want us to remember and go back to, the work of a shepherd is to keep the flock safely together. And let's see how these leaders in Acts 6 do this. They do five things to keep this flock together and to keep the mission aligned. First, I see that the leaders believe the complaint. There's no indication in Luke's writing that they denied it or minimized it or made excuses, like talked about, like we meant, we meant to do that, or that they were like, you know, we're real busy. I mean, there were a couple thousand people in this community that they were responsible for, and it kept growing and growing and growing. I mean, I would kind of understand if they were like, look, we got a lot going on. Can we just like, can you give us a little bit of a break? But that's not what happens in the passage. The complaint is made. And then in verse two, so the 12 gathered all the disciples together. 
they believed them. They believed them, and in wisdom, they were like, this is a predator. This is an enemy. This is an enemy to our mission of keeping the flock together. And so we have to deal with this, even though the complaint was probably against them. I mean, if you remember back four, like Acts 4, they were responsible for distri distributing things. So the first thing is they believed them. These shepherds believed the flock. Instead of using the criticism as a wedge, they used it as a catalyst to keep the community together. Because what they do, again, what I just read, they brought everybody together. The leaders called together the flock. They didn't create a committee. They didn't go the expedient route, like let's take care of this real quick. I mean, they gathered the whole community. Again, this could have been thousands of people. Now, I don't understand the operational situation. I mean, I've worked in big conferences with operations and how you keep all the people together. I don't know how they did it, but I believe it. They believed the criticism and they brought the community together. The third thing they did to shepherd the flock is that they deputized the group to pick the shepherds among them. So they squashed sort of this temptation to hold all the power, the predator, the predator of power, right? They squashed that by sharing the power. I mean, my interpretation of verse three is brothers and sisters, you choose. So they believed them, they called them together, they deputized them, they shared power. Now they did give some criteria. The shepherds you choose should be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. So in this criteria, they dealt with a predator of pecking order or of favorites. Even like, it wasn't like, they need to have this much education or they need to be this or the, I mean, the two things, full of faith, full of wisdom. So by that recommendation or requirement, they deal with favoritism, nepotism, all those sorts of things. And finally, they kept the Jerusalem flock together by blessing the decision of the people. And we see that in verse six. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. The leaders blessed more leaders. We see in Acts 6 that the shepherd kept the flock together. They kept the flock together. Where there was division, division that the community inherited, by the way, where there was division, there was now a move toward unity. And here are a few places where I see that the flock was brought back together. One, in verse five, it states that everybody liked the proposal. I mean, I can't be with four friends and like agree on where we wanna to go to lunch. I mean, someone's gonna give in and be like, all right, tacos, fine. But here you have thousands of people. Verse five, this proposal pleased the whole group. The 12 were full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit, and full of wisdom. And we can see that their decision was a good one because everybody liked it. Everybody agreed. Secondly, I inferred this earlier, but verse 7, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples increased. The passage starts with growth and ends with growth. And this is Luke's way of saying, hey, we got off course there. We were a little bit over like in, in like <laughs> the jagged rocks and... People were going to start falling off and it was going to be, you know, but we're back together. The shepherds kept the flock together and we're back together on the path of community and righteousness again. As I mentioned earlier, the role of the shepherd is quite simple. You lead the flock of sheep, food, water, a place of rest, and then you bring them back home. But if there are predators along the way, then you deal with the predators for the sake of the sheep, for the sake of the community, for the sake of that individual sheep, but also for the sake of the community. And if sheep get disconnected from the group, you go get them and you bring them back because the shepherd's mission is to keep the flock together. In the church, shepherds get involved by leading people to nourishment and rest. And they deal with predators who disrupt and break up the community and they seek to bring members in the community back into the community where there has been broken relationship. Primarily,
really shepherding is a function of radical hospitality. Radical hospitality. <clears throat> the shepherd keeps the flock together at all costs. Now, I, a friend of mine, is she's a follower of Jesus, and the story I'm about to tell, it's not a church story, but it is a story about how a shepherd kept people together. She was the president of a healthcare system in California, and um, one day she got a letter in the mail, and it said, Dear Mrs. Smith, I received a letter from you in the mail, and I perceive you are lying. Respectfully yours, John Doe. Now, she's a president of this whole shebang. We all know she didn't write that letter, right? I mean, she's got people writing for her communications department, all this sort of stuff. So what she did is she went around to find out, like, hey, what are all the letters that are going out? You know, can you get me the letters? And um, so she, you know, found out the letters. And then she called John Doe, and she said, hey, um, in all my life, no one, I've never been called a liar before. I've never, I mean, I have faults, but lying is not one of them. And I'm wondering if you would come in and explain to me how the letter from me gave you the perception I was lying. So she brought this guy into her office and he showed her how the letter did seem to be shrouding the truth. And in the end, she believed him. She was like, I can totally see that. I can totally see what you're saying. She's obviously pretty amazing, as you can imagine. She invited him to then be involved in like, they had a volunteer system with this whole health care. Um, it was the um, audiences to seniors, and they just had a whole, it's pretty amazing what, they, what they're doing there. And the day she told me this story um, is the day that she just got back from speaking at his funeral. So she was a little late for our dinner because she was speaking his funeral. She kept the flock together. A complaint came to her. And instead of freaking out and who the heck is this person, fine, we don't need, like we've got thousands, literally thousands of other people paying into this insurance thing, into this healthcare system. She's like, you know what? Let me check this out. And realized it was true. Changed the way they communicated. She brought that person in to help do some volunteer stuff. She kept the flock together, so much so that when he passed away, she was one of the speakers at his funeral. Shepherds keep the flock together. They believe people, they bring people together, <clears throat> they share power, they deal with predators, temptations of pecking order, favoritism, ego. And this is what shepherds do. So where I want to go now is to ask you, like, how might you be involved in shepherding the community there at Uptown? Like any community of believers, I'm guessing that there are predators seeking to disrupt what God wants to do there. There could be things like in Acts 6, like implicit bias against differences about culture and language and gender and socioeconomic differences, theological differences, um, different church experiences, people who come from communities that they love, and maybe Uptown's not like that, so there can be some, um, you know, that can be an enemy to community, sort of like, oh, I wish it was like this other place where I used to go. I wish this community was different like that other one that I love so much. I mean, do I need the low-hanging fruit is political differences, how we feel about currently what's happening, what may happen in November. Other enemies to keeping the flock together, criticism that it really is about tearing down, it's not building up. I mean, in Acts 6, I mean, they were, they were mad, they were critical. But their criticism was to keep the flock together, was to not like further drive a wedge in the flock, in the community. Defensiveness and ego. Again, like what if my friend would have been defensive about that letter and just like, forget it, you know, like, there's plenty more, but no, shepherds go and they get the, the sheep and they bring them back to the flock. Lack of forgiveness is an enemy of shepherding, an unwillingness to forgive, 
perhaps being resistant to change, grasping for power, not willing to share power, mistrust about people in another experience in your life, but then that's brought to the up-down community. That's not the kind of, you know, that's an enemy. That sort of thing is an enemy. It's not the sort of thing that keeps the flock together. So I want to offer just a few ideas about how um, you might function as a shepherd in the uptown community. Some of you, I'm hoping, have a real sense of like, wow, I think God has given me to this community to help shepherd, to help keep the flock together. That would be amazing. It would be gorgeous if that was happening for some of you, and I hope that that is happening. But ways you can function as a shepherd that keeps the community together is you can mediate a conversation between people so you know that two people are not getting along for whatever reason. You help them talk to each other and you invite like honest conversation and real forgiveness. Stopping the gossiping is a, is a really great way to keep the flock together. And I know it's hard. I know like... I mean, we say, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can hurt, but words do hurt. And um, our perception of someone else, and we share that, <coughs> is it a perception that builds people up or does it potentially split the flock? Another way to function as a shepherd in your community is to honor the leadership by working with them and not against them. Aligning yourself with the mission of this community. And again, it may not be like other communities or other missions that you've been a part of, but adding yourself to what's happening in this community is a way to participate as a shepherd to keep the community together. Certainly, you can call and connect with people. I mean, I know there's a lot of talk about people who are exhausted from Zoom and all those sorts of things, but not everybody, maybe not everybody's Zooming. And instead of waiting for someone to contact you, which I hope that happens, I hope you get contacted, but you could reach out. You could reach out and see how other people are doing. You could call them on the phone. I know people don't call or talk on the phone very much anymore, but, or at least my friends don't, so I don't know what's happening there. Um, but calling and checking in, inviting, you know, doing things where people can connect. These are all things that shepherds can do. <clears throat> the function of shepherd, along with apostle, prophets, evangelists, and teachers, it's a gift from God. We learned that in Ephesians 4. This is a gift. And the gift is for the people of God so that we will mature. The church, a community that doesn't really shepherds to keep the flock together or has shepherds who refuse to get involved, our churches that aren't growing and they're not maturing. Uptown community, I am so excited for when we can be together again <clears throat> and I can hear the stories from all you shepherds of the things that you did to keep the flock together, how you've aligned yourself with the mission and you're growing in maturity and the community is having a godly influence there in the neighborhood. Because all those things happen when shepherds keep the flock together. Let's pray. Jesus, you truly are the good shepherd. You're the best shepherd. <clears throat> we love you and we thank you for how you've brought us to yourself and how you've brought us to each other. That when we follow you, we are in community. And I pray, God, particularly for people who are hearing this and they're like, wow, I think I might be a shepherd. And they want to grow in that, and I pray for you to nurture that God and for you to speak and to help them. But I pray also for this community that they would all grow in a shepherding function and they would all grow in a desire to keep the flock together, to not let division and things split them up. That they would be wary of enemies. Not overprotective, God, not not, um, you know, God, in a really grace-filled way, keep, keep together. 
always open for the newcomer. Always, always open and looking. In fact, looking for sheep that should be in the uptown community but aren't yet. And looking for those people and making a place for them. Showing radical hospitality. And I pray this God so that this community would mature and it would grow and grow into the fullness of who you are, Jesus, as mentioned in Ephesians 4. <clears throat> Thank you for this time. Thank you for technology. <clears throat> Bless Pastor Jeremy and his family. I'm grateful for them. Amen. Thank you, Una, for that amazing, challenging, wonderful word. As we think about and reflect on what she offered to us, shepherds keep the flock together. Are you feeling and sensing the call of the Holy Spirit, that prick in your heart, God asking you to fulfill the role and the function of a shepherd? to bring radical hospitality to the Uptown Church family, to foster unity, connection, growth, so that not only those that are part feel connected and feel at home, but that others can come in as well. I want to encourage you, if you feel that you have that sense of gifting in terms of who you are is a shepherd, to let that flourish and let that uh, be manifested here within our church. Also, Una mentioned a few things that creep into church communities that need the shepherd to come in to uh, bring health and healing so that unity isn't destroyed. So we must ask ourselves, are we engaging in any of those activities? Are we participating in some way to bring unhealth and disunity? Are we doing something that might be trying to tear down the church versus to build it up? Because we need shepherds to help guide us and lead us back so that our actions and our behaviors. So as we think this morning and as we reflect, and thank you, Una, once again for sharing those words, let's Release the giftings, the role, and the function of the shepherd within the Uptown Church family. And may the Holy Spirit guide each of us so that we do not bring the divisive behaviors, or as she said, become the predator that comes in to uh, weaken versus strengthen the church as well. I'm going to invite David to come back up to lead us in one more song, a song of surrender. And if you are here this morning and you feel God prompting you to function within this role of the shepherd, would you just surrender to him as David leads us and say, Lord, use me? And if you feel and if you know that Una said something that really brought a moment of conviction into your heart to say, ooh, I might be doing, ooh, I might be participating in behavior or doing something ah, that needs the correction of the shepherd, would you once again surrender to the Holy Spirit? and ask the Lord to restore, mend, and heal. Let's sing together.
Where's my pride? And I lay it down. Here's my pride. I lay it down. And I lay it down. Surrender it all to you. I surrender it all. Go and give it to you. And here's my fear, and I lay it down. And here's my fear, and I lay it down. And I lay it down, and I surrender it all. I surrender it all to you. I surrender it all to you. I let go and give it to you. And I surrender it all to you. I surrender it all to you. I surrender it all to you. I let go and give it to you. I surrender it all to you. I let go and give it to you. Oh, I lay it down. encourage you guys right now just to put in your own words there whatever it is in your life right now that the, you feel the Holy Spirit's been um, been touching in your life and just putting his finger on that thing that needs to lay down whatever it is just put in your words right now and I lay down just whisper it, say it out loud, whatever it is. And I lay it down. For some of us, as we just saying, it is fear. And that is something we got to realize that we, if we're trusting the Lord, we need to lay down our fear. We need to lay down anything that we're trusting other than the Lord right now. So let's sing that verse again just one more time. my fear and I lay it down and here's my fear and I lay it down sing it again one more time and here's my fear and I lay it down and here's my I lay it down, and I lay it down, I surrender it all to you, I surrender it all to you, I surrender it all to you, I surrender it all to you. I let go and give it to you, I surrender it all to you. I surrender it all to you. I let go and give it to you.
Thank you all for joining us and participating and being part of our church service this morning. We will continue on Zoom in a few minutes as soon as we finish here. Uh, it's a chance for us to get together as a church, see one another, hear one another. Uh, we will start by talking about uh, the service, the sermon, what Una shared with us. Uh, we will uh, be able to unpack and unfold a little bit more how the Holy Spirit was speaking to us concerning the role and the function of the shepherd. And it's also going to be a time for us just to just see how one another is doing in this time that we see each other so frequently right now. So would you join us on Zoom uh, in about five minutes right after we end the service here? Uh, I want to remind you to uh, fill out the church survey uh, that the link is being provided for uh, in uh, the comment section and to also get your submissions in for the All Church Sing Along so that David can uh, compile uh, the video together. Uh, both of these things we would like to have everybody in by Labor Day within a few weeks. Would you join me in reciting our benediction uh, prayer together? Lord, Give me opportunities this week to help disrupt suffering and mend what is broken with the hope of Jesus. Where there is violence, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is poverty, help me to offer the resources I have. Where there is addiction, may I pray for the power of your freedom. Where there is loneliness, use me to foster community. Where there is an overabundance of convenience, teach me to sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. And for all of those that want to recite it in Spanish, here it is. Señor, dame la oportunidad esta semana de interrumpir el sufrimiento y remendar lo que está quebrantado con, con la esperanza, esperanza de, de Jesús. Donde haya violencia, hazme un instrumento de tu paz. Donde haya pobreza, ayúdame a ofrecer de los recursos que tengo. Donde haya adicción, que pueda orar por el poder de tu libertad. Donde haya soledad, utilízame para fomentar el compañerismo. Donde haya sobreabundancia de comodidad, enséñame a sacrificar. En el nombre de Jesús. Amén. Thank you so much for being here and joining us. Uh, we invite you to participate with, on, on Zoom with us in a few minutes. May we go through this week feeling empowered to be released in the role and the function of the shepherd as the Holy Spirit enables us and prompts us. And may we listen to the voice of the shepherd if we need correction or adjustment in terms of how we are living and operating. Thank you for being here.